Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan McKittrick. I'm the director of artistic programs at the American Repertory Theater. And it is my great pleasure to introduce this evening the two extraordinary writers and activists um, who I've had the great privilege of working with uh, over the past decade at the American Repertory Theater. Uh, I'm going to read their full bios. I tried to cut them down, but I found it impossible. So. I'm going to read their full bios. Eve Ensler uh, is the Tony Award-winning playwright, activist, and author of the Obie Award-winning theatrical phenomenon, The Vagina Monologues, published in over 48 languages and performed in over 140 countries. Her plays include Lemonade, Extraordinary Measures, Necessary Targets, OPC, which premiered at the American Repertory Theater, The Good Body, Emotional Creature, Fruit Trilogy, and In the Body of the World, which also premiered um, at the ART, an adaptation of Eve's uh, memoir, which premiered at the ART and uh, starred Eve, and then starred Eve uh, in a production at the Manhattan Theater Club. Uh, she, her newly released and best-selling book, The Apology, which we'll be speaking about this evening, has been called Transfixing, Revelatory, and Cathartic. Her writings appear regularly in The Guardian and Time Magazine, and Eve is also the founder of V-Day, the 21-year-old global activist movement, which has raised over $100 million to end violence against all women and girls, cisgender, transgender, and gender nonconforming. And Eve is also the founder of One Billion Rising. Yes, please applaud. Eve is also the founder of One Billion Rising, the largest global mass action to end gender-based violence in over 200 countries. She is a co-founder of the City of Joy, a revolutionary center for women survivors of violence in the DRC, along with Christine Schuler dreschever and Dr. Denis Mukwege, all of whom appeared in the award-winning documentary film, City of Joy, released globally on September 7th as a Netflix original. Eve has been named one of Newsweek's 150 Women Who Changed the World and The Guardian's 100 Most Influential Women. Timothy Patrick McCarthy is an award-winning scholar and educator, public servant, and social, social justice activist who has taught on the faculty at Harvard University since 2005. He currently holds a joint appointment in the Undergraduate Honors Program in History and Literature, Graduate School of Education, and John F. Kennedy School of Government, where he is core faculty at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Twice named one of Harvard Crimson's Professors of the Year, he received the 2019 Manuel Carballo Award for Excellence in Teaching, the Kennedy School's highest teaching honor. The adopted only son and grandson of public school teachers and factory workers, Tim was educated at Harvard and Columbia, where he received his PhD in history. A noted historian of politics and social movements, he is the author or editor of five books from the New Press, including the forthcoming Stonewall's Children, Living Queer History in an Age of Liberation, Loss, and Love. A frequent media commentator, he served as guest editor for the nation's historic Reclaiming Stonewall 50 Forum in June 2019. He is also, I'm very happy to say, a board member at the American Repertory Theater, where he hosts the ART of Human Rights and Resistance Mic. And on a personal note, I just want to say that I can very clearly remember the days when Tim and Eve each came into our world at the ART. Uh, with Tim, it was a post-performance conversation at Oberon where he electrified the audience. I think the post-performance conversation was the event for the evening. And with Eve, it was in our artistic office years ago when she came to speak to us about a play she had written, OPC, Obsessive Political Correctness and a possible adaptation of her memoir in the body of the world. And we started talking about the ART becoming a theatrical home for Eve. When I think about Eve and Tim's work, I think, of course, about the rigor, the passion, the unwavering commitment. Uh, but I also think about the love and joy that they both emanate. They are, for me, a constant source of inspiration and guidance and I feel so lucky to have them in our ART family. I'm not gonna to say too much about the apology because Tim and Eve are gonna be talking about the book, but I will just say that it is one of the most profound and powerfully bo written books that I've read. And I had, while I was reading it, the feeling that I was 
having a kind of transformational experience and reading something that offered a radical potential for change and healing. And so to talk more about to the, the apology tonight, I'd like to welcome to the stage Eve Ensler and Tim McCarthy. Hello, everyone. I'm Tim McCarthy. <laughs> That's Eve Ensler. <laughs> Uh, welcome to our uh, conversation tonight, which is entitled The Alchemy of Apology, an intimate conversation about atonement and justice and freedom. Uh, let me begin by just uh, thanking Ryan. Where did Ryan go? Hi, Ryan. We love you, Thank too. Thank you, Ryan. We that love was you so too. beautiful. We, we almost cried backstage. You're, <laughs> we cherish you and everyone at the ART, Diane Borger, Diane Paulus, Robert Duffley, who has helped out with this event. Every single person in the ART family is, is part of our uh, family. And so thank you for all that you do to support us and to support what is transformative theater and community work. I also want to say um, a special thanks to Andrew Gitchell and Joe Short, who are here at Farkas, who were instrumental in putting this uh, on, or still in instrumental <laughs> in putting this on. They're, they're working right now. Uh, to Deb Levine. Uh, and to James Stanley at the Theater, Dance, and Media Concentration here at Harvard, which is an incredible new multidisciplinary, outside-the-box kind of undergraduate experience that uh, transcends so many of Harvard's strictures. Uh, also to our co-sponsors, the Committee on Degrees in Women, Gender, and Sexuality, the History and Literature Concentration, uh, my Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School, and also the Women in Public Policy Program at the Kennedy School. All of these amazing places are co-sponsors of tonight's event. And then I want to thank two other special people. First, Tony Montanieri, who's backstage with Pablo, uh, Eve's dog. <laughs> uh, hello, Pablo and Tony. We love you, too. Uh, and then finally, uh, thank you and welcome to uh, the brilliant and uh, radical and wonderful Eve Ensler. It's so great to be with you again. So happy to be back with you. Yes, yes. So we're going to have a conversation about a lot of things, uh, starting with Eve's new remarkable book, The Apology. We're going to talk about that for a bit, and then we're going to talk about a lot of other things, the personal, the political, and the transformative. We should also welcome everybody to Impeachment Inquiry Night. Yeah. Hot off the press, breaking woo, news. Woo, woo. There it is. And he will not be named tonight. So <laughs> Only as predator-in-chief. Predator only chief, to be referred to. Exactly. All right. Uh, well, so we'll talk for about an hour or so, and then we're going to open it up for a conversation with all of you from the audience. And then afterwards, uh, we have copies of books uh, of Eve's book, The Apology, uh, to buy and to have signed in the lobby immediately following the program. So, Eve, let's begin um, with the beginning. Every book has an origin story. Can you share with us a little bit the origin story of The Apology? Mm -hmm. Well, first, let me say how happy I am to be here tonight um, again with this amazing human being who I love so much. And thank you, Ryan, for those beautiful words. And thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. I know everybody has lots that they're doing. So I really appreciate having this conversation. Um, I, think, I think this book has, has, has several um, streams of origin. One um, is that I am a, a child of a, a very violent um, and really quite mad father. And I was sexually abused when I was young. Um, and then I was really um, badly physically abused from most of my childhood. And I think I always believed there was going to come a day mm. when my father was going to wake up and say he was sorry. Mm. Like he'd come to his senses, you know, because he was also an alcoholic. And I, I thought later in my life, you know, there'd be that moment of that reckoning where he would really come to, and that didn't happen. Um, and he died 31 years ago. But there's been a yearning. I don't think that yearning for apology ever goes away, that yearning for someone to say the truth, to take responsibility, to spell it out, what they've done. So that's lived in me and, and expressed itself in in various forms, um, often in rage when I was younger, um, sometimes in sorrow, sometimes in emptiness. So there's that 
strain. And then I think having worked for many, many years in the movement to end violence against women and girls, a movement that is actually a very long movement that's 70 years old, going back to African-American women in this country, who really were the origin, really started the movement to end violence against women, mm -hmm. fighting off rape from their slave owners. Um, and now coming into this new iteration of Me Too, um, I was just thinking, I was in Congo and I was thinking, I had spent the day at City of Joy and again I was listening to women tell their stories. And I was thinking, okay, women have told their stories for years, we've broken the silence for years, we've put ourselves out there, we've built shelters, we've built hotlines, we've actually operated as if violence against women was our issue, when in fact it's a men's issue, we don't, it turns out, rape ourselves. Um, and I was sitting there thinking, wow, I have never heard a man make a public apology for raping, beating a woman, a real apology. Not, I'm sorry if that hurt you, or I'm sorry if you feel bad, or I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. But, and, and, then I was start, and then I started to go through history. Like in 16,000 years of patriarchy, is there any recorded apology of a man? And, and I, was, I was reading through a lot of men who in, in recent times, in the Me Too era, um, have been accused, but all of their so-called apologies were actually kind of self-pitying rants right. about how their careers had been destroyed and look what happened to me, poor me. But no responsibility, no seeming self-interrogation, no after the fact, maybe I should go to therapy and look at my behavior and investigate why I did that or what would lead to that. Just simply what's happened to me and how horrible. And then it, it really struck me, why has there been no apologies? If, you know, wherever something is absent, it often indicates there is something powerful happening there, yeah, right? right. And, and so I started to think about, well, first of all, why have there been no apologies? What is the significant, significance of an apology? And then I thought, well, we've done everything else. Why don't I just write my father's apology, you know? Um, why don't I sit down and try to go into my father and try to say and everything to me and write everything to me that I needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And at least for me, it will be something profound. And maybe it might be a possible blueprint for what other people might want to try to do mm. who have to, who, who are seeking a way. And I really believe people unconsciously or consciously seeking ways out of the prison of guilt yeah. and, and self-hatred that they live in having inflicted harm on other people. I, I have to believe that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the, the pathway to doing it. And can I ask just a quick follow-up about this moment? Like, was there something about now, either in your career or your life or in the larger world that, that, that propelled this into the world at this moment? I feel like we're stuck. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're stuck. I think, look, I mean, we mm -hmm. have called men out we 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 create cases. We've changed laws. But look, this week in in one month, yeah. femicide is out of control in Spain. In France, 150 women have been killed by their partners in the, just in this year. In South Africa, there were thousands in the street this week. We're not ending the violence. Yeah. We're stuck. And I feel that if we don't get underneath what's mm -hmm. going on, mm -hmm. if we, if if men don't start looking at their behavior and the roots of that behavior and, the, and what patriarchal structures and patriarchal mandates and conditioning have done, we are going to be doing this work as long as climate crisis allows us, you know? Right. And, and I think, I mean, it's like, which one's going to get us first? It's hard to tell, yeah. you know? Yeah. But I think, I think, I think, well. um, it, it, I think part of, I, I, and I, I don't think they're disconnected. Yeah. I don't think they're disconnected. And I've been thinking about that so much this week. Yeah. Um, how we treat our mother, how we treat our earth, how we see our earth, whether we see her or we don't see her, mm. whether we acknowledge her, whether we revere her, whether we cherish her, right? Mm. Whether we pay attention to her, whether we are, are, are deep and deep in gratitude for her generosity. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly the same how we treat women. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we have the same 
pillaging aspect, the same plundering, the same take what isn't yours, take more than your share, invade what you want, don't heed the messages, don't, don't listen to the body of the earth and what the body is telling you. There is no consent here, there is no, no, there is no yes. So I think for me, mm. it, you know, writing this book was a commitment to saying we have to go to the next stage. Right. We have to go to the next stage of consciousness. Right. You know. Right. So I've shared with you, I read the book for the first time over the summer, and I emailed you immediately when I finished it. Uh, I picked it up and put it down many times. We talked about privately about the, the reading of that and the reaction that it had in me. Um, it's a revelation. I, I will say that it is unlike any book I have ever read, and I've read a couple books. Um, <laughs> So now I, I'd like us to, to sort of experience it uh, audibly. So do you want to set up the, the mm -hmm. audio clips? Um, I just want everyone to know I made a decision that I would never read from the book, that only men would read from it. Um, and so um, because I feel like it has to be delivered in a man's voice. Um, so there's a wonderful man named Eduardo B Ballerini who recorded it. and. Um, Tonight, we're going to play a few of the clips that are kind of spaced out over the book. Um, I just want to just say that it's difficult material. If you're a survivor, just, um, just warning, you know, it could um, evoke feelings. Um, but I also will say that I just want to say about Eduardo, um, he had a really profound experience doing the recording. As a matter of fact, he wrote to me that he broke down sobbing in the middle of it. Yeah. And it, he told me that it really changed his relationship to his children afterwards. And that really touched me and, and deeply. And I've been really moved by so many men's response to this book. It's really um, made me much more hopeful. Yeah. Um, so he's going to be reading a few sections um, throughout. And if you can just pause it a beat between each section so there's, there's a breath, that would be great. Great. How very strange to be writing you. Am I writing to you from the grave, or the past, or the future? Am I writing as you, or as you would like me to be, or as I really am beneath my own limited understanding? And does it matter? Am I writing in a language I never spoke or understood, which you have created inside both of our minds to bridge the gaps, the failures to connect? Maybe I am writing as I truly am, as you have freed me by your witness. Or I'm not writing this at all, but simply being used as a vehicle to fulfill your own needs and version of things. You always wrote me letters. I found that peculiar and strangely moving. We lived in the same house, but you were writing to me, your little girl handwriting attempting straight lines, but wandering all over the page. It was as if you were trying to make contact with some aspect of me, a part you could not find in the heated moments of our conflict, as if you were trying through poetry to appeal to a secret self that I had once made available to you. Usually you wrote apology letters. So fitting that you would now want an apology letter from me. You were always apologizing, begging for forgiveness. I had reduced you to a daily degrading mantra of, I'm sorry. This apology required time. It could not be rushed. Fortunately, I've had practice here endlessly reliving and rehashing my crimes, mentally reenacting the details. I know you have said that an apology must be thorough and can only be trusted in its veracity and dedication to details. I have done my best. I have followed your very strict guidelines. Recognize what I have done as a crime. Face how deeply my actions and violations have impacted and devastated you. See you as a human being. Attempt to experience or feel what it felt like inside you. Feel profound remorse and regret over my actions. And finally, take responsibility for my actions by doing extensive work to understand what made me do what I did. I will need to go back in this letter to locate the roots of my behavior. I will be as honest as a formerly disingenuous person can be. I will attempt to proceed with neither defensiveness nor self-pity, as I understand neither will further clarify nor resolve. I would find myself in your room at some twilight hour. I only felt alive between the daylight and darkness, 
in that crepuscular realm where dream and memory are indecipherable. That's how I controlled you. Those aphoric hours where others in the house were lost in sleep and you were in a trance, separated from your body. I would find myself sitting on your bed, somehow carried there by shadow men. You would pretend to be asleep, as if what was happening was not happening. You desperately wanted it and me to go away. I didn't go away. I never spoke, never uttered a sound. The silence was my power. Words would break the spell, make it real and ugly and what it was. What kind of bastard have I been? What kind of destruction have I wrought? I have lied and lied to myself and you. I cursed your future of love. At five, I took your body. You didn't give it to me. I contaminated your sweetness. I ripped the protective golden gates from your garden. I betrayed your trust. I rearranged your sexual chemistry and the basis of your desire. Wrongness and excitement were forever fused together. I made my stain. I left my stinking mark. I infected you. By invading and overwhelming your body, I killed your yearning so early. You did not and could not give me permission. There was no consent. You did not seduce me with your crinoline petticoats. You were simply being an adorable child. I overstimulated your five-year-old body and planted the seeds of intensity and thrill. You would push yourself too far, take heroin, jump off bridges, drive a hundred miles an hour. I robbed you of the ordinary. I destroyed your notion of family. I forced you to betray your mother. You lived in perpetual self-hatred and guilt. I created hierarchy, distrust, and violent competition between you and your siblings. None of you would recover from this. I robbed you of agency over your body. You didn't make any decisions. You didn't say yes. That was my projection in order to satisfy my needs. You were five years old. I was 52. You had no sovereignty. I exploited and abused you. I took your body. It was no longer yours. I rendered you passive. You compulsively gave it to whoever wanted it because I taught you you should. I forced you out of your body and because you were dislocated and numb, you were unable to protect yourself. I compromised your safety and ability to defend yourself. I made it so that rape became what turned you on. I eviscerated your necessary boundaries so you never knew what was yours and when to say no or how to say stop. I tore the delicate walls of your vagina and made it vulnerable to disease and infection. Your body didn't and couldn't say yes. This was a convenient lie I told myself. You didn't know it was sex. I took what I needed by convincing myself you needed it too. I exploited your adoration. I forced you into secrecy, to lie to your mother, to develop a dual life. This split you in two. I made you feel like a whore. I made you feel you were never worthy of legitimate love. I made intimacy claustrophobic. I left my poison in you. I destroyed your memory by making you want to forget everything. This impacted your intelligence and ability to contain facts and take tests. I stole your innocence. I dimmed your life force and made you feel your sexuality was the cause of bad things. I used your being and body to serve myself. I did all this. Eve, let me say these words. I am sorry. I am sorry. Let me sit here at the final hour. Let me get it right this time. Let me be staggered by your tenderness. Let me risk fragility. Let me be rendered vulnerable. Let me be lost. Let me be still. Let me not occupy or oppress. Let me not conquer or destroy. 
Let me bathe in the rapture. Let me be the father. Let me be the father who mirrors your kind-heartedness back to you. Let me lay no claims. Let me bear witness and not invade. Eve, I free you from the covenant. I revoke the lie. I lift the curse. Old man, be gone. Backstage, you uh, gave me permission to read one piece of this, which are all of these are your words, of course, too. But this one in particular, the preface. Is that still okay? <laughs> I am done waiting. My father is long dead. He will never say the words to me. He will not make the apology. So it must be imagined. For it is in our imagination that we can dream across boundaries, deepen the narrative, and design alternative outcomes. This letter is an invocation, a calling up. I have tried to allow my father to speak to me as he would speak. Although I have written the words I needed my father to say to me, I had to make space for him to come through me. There is so much about him, his history, that he never shared with me, so I've had to conjure much of that as well. This letter is my attempt to endow my father with the will and the words to cross the border and speak the language of apology so that I can finally be free. I wanted to ask following that, who is or who are the audiences for this book? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, I, it kind of goes back to who wrote it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because sometimes I'm not really clear who wrote this book. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I saw Coleman Barks last night, the wonderful, brilliant translator of Rumi and other incredible poems. Mm -hmm. and. He was reading the book, and he, he was just talking about imagination, mm -hmm. and and just the, the, he he was really he just said it's a feat of imagination, and I was thinking about imagination, yeah. how we're living in a time right now that requires the most profound imagination. It's like we have to we have to imagine above this world we're living in right now. We have to imagine out of this world because this realm is sinking us, mm -hmm. right? And I think what started to happen as I started to write this book is that um, I discovered, first of all, that my father has been living inside me so profoundly, yeah. has occupied me, occupied me. Like, the tanks are there. They, they were there for years and years. Like, I have been occupied. And once I sort of made the decision that I was going to allow him to speak, mm. I began to discover how deeply yeah. he lived in me yeah. and how deeply his voice and his impressions and his vocabulary, like I, he uses words in this book that I don't even know, yeah. right? They're just not my vocabulary. Right. His, he has an authorial voice that is just not my voice. But once he began to speak and right. it really taught me something about how we live in each other how we move through each other in ways that we, I, I'm just beginning to understand. Mm -hmm. And particularly our family, but particularly our abuser. Because I think when, when we are perpetrated, when we are invaded, when we are violated, our perpetrator enters us. They actually mm -hmm. take up the shop, and they take up house inside of us. And, and I think, um, the discovery of, of how deeply he was there was profound, but what was also really profound was the discovery of how I could move him in another direction. Mm. That he was me and I was him, but I had agreed to a certain yeah. par a paradigmic relationship. Which mm. right, with, I would mm. be his perpetual victim and he would be my perpetrator. Right. And writing this book, I suddenly went, oh, 
I can move him in another direction. <laughs> right, right. I don't have to be his victim. Mm. I like I, I was I was doing a reading the other night, and this little boy, he was like eight years old, stood up to me and he said, he just asked me these really brilliant questions, and he said, "Did you feel how that you had the power of writing this book, or did your father have the power of writing this book?" Wow. And I went, "I had the power. Yeah. I was writing the book, yeah. right?" But there were moments when I wasn't sure who had the power, mm. right? Because when he started to speak, I got as intimidated by him then yeah. as I did when I was a child. Yeah. Do you know? So it was like, who is in control of the story? And when I say that relates to the audience, it's like, I feel I wrote this book because I really believe deep in my heart, and I feel like Greta at the UN yesterday. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm gonna believe you're not evil, mm -hmm. right? I really believe men are seeking a way out of patriarchy, the majority of them. I really am gonna believe this. And I think we need pathways. Mm. We need pathways. So I, I have lived with enormous amount of rage at my father for years and years yeah. and years. Yeah. And I know I live in the world and I talk about empathy. I've worked in prisons for years where I have incredible empathy for women who have murdered, for women who have done horrible crimes. I can empathize, but when it comes to men in my life, I see I have an empathy lacking quotient mm. for a long time. Mm. And I heard myself recently, before I wrote this book, going on my rant about men, my bad, my bad. <laughs> and I went, is this who you're gonna be forever? Hmm. Are you going to hold this rage? Hmm. Are you going to hold this position? Are you going to hold this, 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 this story? Or are you going to open up to a different story? Hmm. Or do you want to hold this rage? Because that rage is keeping you. Hmm. You know, it's like, as my father says, his mother says in the book, like, anger is a potion you mix for a friend, but you drink yourself. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm the person suffering from that rage. Yeah. That's holding me back in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And so, I think writing this book, I was hoping to write a pathway yeah. that men would say, oh my God, here's a possible way I can get out of this, uh, out of this story of patriarchy. Right, you right. Know? And of course I was writing it for you know, all the women who have never gotten an apology, which is probably about you know, how many people are on the planet. Yeah. You know, probably about four billion women. You yeah. know, um, I, I don't know, a woman. is there a woman here who isn't waiting for an apology? Mm. Please raise your hand. You know, um, I mean, I think, I, I think it, it, is, it is the basis of so much of our existence, wanting our suffering, wanting what has been done to us, wanting our hurt, wanting um, all the ways that hurt has destabilized us and robbed us of confidence and robbed us of vision and taking years away from our lives that we've had to recover rather than, than just being brilliant and doing our work. You know, the desire yeah. for someone to see that is so profound. Mm. And so mm. I think part of the book was that too. Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about this? The, the, the book is titled The Apology, right? There's, a, there's an, a deep element of atonement here. And even though your father literally can't atone and apologize, he does in this imagination, right? In your imagination. And now on the page and in the world. And to me, you know, I've read this book a couple of times now, most recently this week again, and it feels to me like this book is an attempt or an example of restorative justice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And rather than a forgive and forget project, mm -hmm. this is about a reckoning and remembering mm -hmm. and a reclaiming in some way. So can you talk a little bit about this book in that context? Mm -hmm. Because I think Restorative justice, we talked about this backstage, and you and I are both deeply committed to this as a project and a radical kind of reimagining of the world. But it's hard to wrap your head mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. this work and to, to practice, much less to practice mm -hmm. it. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the book in that context? Yeah, and I, and I, and I think for me, um, you know, I think there were aspects of writing this book that weren't that difficult yeah. and aspects that were almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And one of the aspects was trying to understand why my father had done what he had done. Right. Trying to go back and let him tell me the story of his childhood and open his heart to me to explain what are the steps that led him to become the man who was capable of doing right. what he did. Right. And there were moments when he was sharing with me where I would be like, I don't care. 
I just don't care. <laughs> right. I don't want to know. 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 And then I'd be like, why don't you want to know? Mm. Why don't you want to know? Are you committed to being right. his victim forever? Or do you want to understand what were the steps that led him to do? Because I think another thing that plagues survivors is the why. Why? Yeah. Why would my father want to rape and beat his daughter? Why would my best friend drug me and rape me last night? Why, 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 that why? And so part of the work for me was allowing myself, when my father started to explain to me, and not justify, because explanation is different than justification. Right. And I think we have to separate the two. We have to look at the seeds of why people do things mm -hmm. in the world. What are the economic reasons? What are the, all the layers psychologically? What are, there's so many components to why people act out, why people are angry, why people are raging. But when my father began to talk to me about his childhood, yeah. and he began, for example, one of the things that I really learned about was that my father grew up in a time, he was the youngest of right. children and he was born right. 15 years after the last child. So he was the accident that became the miracle, right? Mm. And he was adored, adored. Yeah. But what he explained to me was that adoration is not love. Yeah. Adoration is a projection of someone's idealized image onto you that you are then expected to live up to. That was so compelling. And, and, so, and compelling. so you're never allowed mm -hmm to be your real self. Mm. You're not allowed to express doubts, you're not allowed to cry, you're not allowed. You are an adored being who must serve this idealized projection. And so I began to see how my father was denied his own humanity over and over and over mm. in the name of serving this adored, adored, adored thing. Right. We don't serve people by adoring them. We actually kind of dismiss them. Yeah. We kind yeah. of erase them. Yeah. Adoration is a form of erasure because it doesn't allow people to be human. It doesn't allow to be imperfect. It doesn't allow them to be real. And so when he began to tell me that story, mm. my heart really broke for my father. Wow. And I had days where I would just weep thinking about my father as a little boy wanting to be a human being Mm. and having a story that was already being projected onto him that he had to live up to. So what did he do with all those feelings? He pushed them down, right. and he pushed them down, and he pushed them down, and he pushed them down, and eventually they metastasized into this character that he called Shadow Man, right. which event, who right. eventually surfaced in really around my particular birth, you know? But, and he talks about these images in film, yeah. right? That, that the Shadow Man becomes almost like a, a kind of a character that he's well, seen he well, he he really learned charm. Yeah, like charm. My father went to the movies and he studied all those, you know, characters. Right. The the, the Gary Carrie Cooper, Ga Gary and the Cooper, and the, John Wayne. Well, John, not John Wayne. Mm -hmm. Um, um, oh, Cary Grant. Cary Grant. Right. You know, he, mm -hmm. and he would go and and he would model himself on them, mm -hmm. how they moved and how they operated and how they would whisk their hair with it. And and he was really good at it. He was the most charming person I've ever seen. And. And, but that was also about never being who he was. Right. So he was furthering and furthering the, he was just expanding this gap between his real self and his adored self and his charming self. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is the syndrome for men. Yeah. I think there are many men who do that mm -hmm. and don't know how to get back. You know, there's a, scene, there's a scene, he woke me up one night in the middle of the night, I swear to you, and said, go to your office, I'm gonna tell you a story. And I went to my office and he told me the story about being on a walk with his mother and he saw this little baby bird that had fallen on the ground. Mm. And he picked up the bird and he was in a state of wonder because he feel, could feel the little baby bird alive like in his knuckles. And he was just like in a state of just the heartbeat and the bird and the heartbeat and the bird. And then his mother saw him and said, drop that dirty bird. How could you be holding that dirty bird? Mm. And she hit it and the bird dropped and it died. Mm. And he started to cry. And she said, don't you dare cry. And to me, that kind of explained the whole story of patriarchy in one, in one breath, mm. that we feel the tenderness and the wonder, and we want to have it as boys, and we yeah. want to touch it as boys, and, we, and we're told to drop that thing, yeah. get that thing out of you. Yeah. And then once we've removed it from you, we will not let you feel how bad that feels, yeah. right? right. 
that is a punishment that's so profound. And then we say later, how come our boys are shooting people and killing people and raping people? And we're surprised. Mm. And we're surprised. Mm. 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 I want to pivot now to your, how this book fits into your larger spectacular career. Um, so much of what you've gifted to the world in your work is giving voice to things unsaid. We talk about having faith in things unseen. You've given so many voices to things that have been unsaid or unspoken for so many years, especially for women, though not certainly not exclusively, um, so that we can move closer to freedom or liberation. I like the old word liberation. Um, when you think back on your career from, you know, certainly from the vagina monologues, which is an international phenomenon, uh, published in 48 languages, performed in 140 countries. I mean, it's a remarkable feat. To the apology, right? This is a 25, 30 year career. It's a long time, it's a generation or more. How has your work changed? And what are some of the through lines mm. for you? So sort of change over time and also what's been kind of the consistent motif or theme or narrative? Well, I, I don't know how, I mean, I think what I'm most interested is what people don't want to talk about. Yeah. I've always, it's like I've always felt like growing up in my family, no one was talking about anything that was happening. <laughs> and I just couldn't understand that. I would be thrown against walls and I would, I would be sitting at, the, at a restaurant and I would have blood coming out of my nose and no one would be talking about it. And it'd be like, I'm bleeding, right. <laughs> Do you know? So I've always been obsessed with mm. saying what people won't say because it drives me, it, it drives me crazy. Right. And I think one of the things writing the vagina monologues that was really interesting to me is that like it, at that time, and I wish I could say the play was outdated and I want the play to be outdated, I really do. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but in fact, um, in some ways, it's more relevant right now than it's ever been because there's so many women mm. who are being violated in all these new and sophisticated ways. Um, mm. But one of the things that compelled me about that was when I started to interview women, you know, for the book, which, you know, for the play, which then became fic fic fictitious pieces, so many women were telling me things they had never told anyone in their life. You know, when I was doing the show around the country and around the world, women would line up every show. Yeah. And they would literally say, I was raped when I was five. I've never told anyone this. I was molested by my stepfather. This is the first time I've... And I was thinking to myself, yeah. I'm the first person you've ever told this to? Yeah, right. In right. your life? Right. In your life? Yeah. Right? So I began to understand that there was an underground reality mm -hmm. that was going on, obviously, in people. And I think I'm also really interested in doing the thing that scares me the most. Yeah. So I want to say about the apology, it's not a prescription, it's an offering. There are many survivors that have no desire to do apologies and yeah. that is totally great. And may never want to get an apology, yeah. write an apology, hear an apology, and that's, it's an offering. For me, mm. it was the thing I didn't want to do the most. Yeah. It was the thing I didn't want to hear the most. I didn't want to know about my father. I didn't want to know about his pain. I didn't want to enter that pain. And I, 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 I feel that that place is the place that's most interesting to me. Yeah. Where don't I want to go? Right. That's where I need to go. Yeah. That's what's going to open the next big door. In right. Me. Do you know? But one of the things, I mean, you talked about an offering, it, that implies a relationship, right? I mean, you're very mindful of how the personal engages the political and how the me becomes the we and the us. Um, and your work is really about that. So much of her work is about a co conjuring a collectivity, right? right? And a new imagining of what we can, what we can be like together. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, at least from my perspective, knowing your work the way I do, that it feels to me like you go to places that you are fearful of, right? That you don't want to do, but also that we as a society doesn't want to go, or we're afraid to go there, whether we want to or not, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And do you feel that burden too? I mean, is this something that, that I mean, you're, you're, you do think collectively, right? Oh yeah, I, I mean, I, I have come to assume that I'm afraid of it just about everybody else's. Everybody else's right. You know, I mean, it usually pans <laughs> right. out, the, it's like when I first started saying vagina, it was like not popular. I just yeah. want you to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know everyone, young women today and young men today think, you know, oh, vagina, no, it was not. 
okay? There wasn't any town I ever went that was like, oh, goody, the vaginas are here. That just never happened. Um, and, you know, People are whispering it at no, diners. No, so, yeah, right, no. right, right, yeah. And I can't tell you how many times I was invited to speak when right before I would get up to speak, the person, my host, would say, please don't talk about vagina. Yeah. And I'd say, you invited me. Right. And I would get up immediately and say, can we all say vagina together? For, you know, um, um, because I think there is part of that that just has to be done away with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think also, um, I was scared to write this book. Yeah. I know that if I, someone has suggested to me 10 years ago, even five years ago, about receiving an apology from my father, I would have told them to screw themselves. Yeah. And I know there are many survivors who feel that, and mm. rightly so. Mm. But I also knew that we have to keep pushing it. We mm. have to keep pushing our evolution. We can't get stuck in all the things we've been doing. We have to try for the next thing. Yeah. If we're gonna keep evolving to a higher consciousness, and if we're gonna really try to figure out how to disentangle the incredible tentacles of patriarchy, right? right? right. I, I really wanna say that lately I've been thinking of patriarchy as herpes, mm. right? Mm. No, no, really, it's, it's like this virus mm -hmm. like, is lodged in us, right? And it appears to go away. And it never goes away. No, and the conditions no. change, and suddenly there's an outbreak, right? right? right, right. And I feel like we're in a serious outbreak right now, we right? Are. Um, we are, But um, I, I have described the person who will not be named as the herpes of American politics, yes. so we're right yeah. on the, yeah, we're right exactly. on the same page. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. But in order to get to that place, right, that place that, that you spend so much time imagining, right, that place of freedom or liberation, that place of peace, of justice, of love, um, we have to talk about violence. Mm -hmm. Violence of all kinds. Violence mm -hmm. against women, war, mm -hmm. the violence against the environment, racism and white supremacy, the violence against people of color, immigrants in cages, right? 19 trans LGBT women of color exactly. have been killed this year. Right. These are all violences that target people who are already vulnerable or on the downside of discrimination. And yet we as a society have such a hard time talking about violence because to talk about it is an admission that we are not who we say we are. Mm. Right? This whole idea of a, you know, you know, the kids are in cages. Well, this isn't who we are. Horseshit. Mm -hmm. This is who we've always been. Mm -hmm. Right? And so how do we get over? How do we get out of the violence by talking about the violence? Mm. Is that possible? Do, we, do, do you agree with that? I do, totally do... agree with that. And I think if, if, this, if these last three years have, have been good for any real reason, yeah. they have manifested the truth of the story of this country. Yeah. They have manifested the truth. You don't have to talk yes. to any people of color who will tell you this is new, what's happening here. Right. But a lot of white people have woke up yeah. over the last three years, yeah. right? You don't have to tell, I mean, and I think, and, and, and I wrote a piece in The Guardian like 19 months before um, the predator was elected. Yeah. And I said, you know, um, basically, he will be our reckoning. He will be our reckoning. We will have to come to face who we are. Yeah. And I think the story of this country is, is, is a story of violence on every level, mm. whether it's what happened to the indigenous, whether it's what happened to African Americans, whether it's what's happened to women, whether it's happened to, it, it's a story of violence. And what is violence? What is violence? I think about it every day. Mm. It is the numbing of our ability to feel for another. Yeah. It's the numbing of our ability to feel for life itself, yeah. the earth itself. Right? When I saw that the predator this morning wrote a sarcastic Ugh. email about Greta oh my God. to say she seems like a very happy girl in a very happy life being sarcastic, mm. that is a degree of unfeeling that is unimaginable. Yes. To watch a 16 year old girl on this state of. Who is so brave. Who's so brave in a state of such pain yeah. for the earth and, and to not feel that. That yeah. is violence. Yeah. That is violence. And, and that means that at some point in that story of that person, whatever happened in that system, all those gears got shut down yeah, and right. turned off. That's right. Shut down and turned off. And he is walking around, shut down, turned off. Yeah. And inflicting more and more violence because he can't even feel the violence that he's inflicting. Right. That's a psychotic. That's, That's right. a psychotic. That's, right. That's a definition of a psychotic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and I have to say, I know all of us in the last three years feel utterly traumatized by the enactment of that violence, mm. that daily, daily, daily violence. Yeah. And I think part of what we all have to start doing is asking ourselves, and this is what part of this book was for me, yeah. who don't I feel for? Mm. Who have I rightly justified to myself that I don't feel for? Right? Who, based on my own suffering, my own rape, my own violence, have I decided it's okay that I don't have feelings for? Yeah. Can I tell a story? No. Because it's really connected to this. <laughs> and I, this, this, this story, the story really, I, yeah. I worked at Bedford Hills Correctional Fil Facility for mm. eight years. I ran a group for long-term survivors who um, had been there for violent crimes. And um, I ran the group for eight years. And I just, I just want to take a moment because yeah. one of the women in my group was Judy Clark. Mm -hmm. And she just got out two months ago after, I, I think it's 30 some odd years in prison. Mm -hmm. And I just so, I'm so happy she's out. Um, mm -hmm. But um, in that group, um, I started and I, I would have um, a meeting and there'd be like 10 women in the group and each week they would go around and they would each tell a part of their story, one to five. They could tell two stories from one to five. Mm. So, okay, so the group was really, I immediately fell in love with every woman in the group, except for one, who I did not like at all. And she scared me. And I didn't like the way she looked, I didn't like the way she felt, she gave me the creeps. And then I found out she was there for being a pedophile. And then I didn't like her even more. Mm. And, okay, so this, she didn't speak in the first group, and in the second group, she came in and she sat right next to me and I was like, oh my God, okay. And I, I was having no feelings for her, honestly. I didn't have any compassion for her. I had dismissed her. I had written her off. But everybody else in the room, I was loving. It didn't matter that everybody there had killed people. I adored them. I was with them. So they went around. And by the way, every woman in that group who had been radically sexually abused, radically violently violated in their lives, got to her. Mm. I'm gonna start crying, because every time I think about this story. And she said, um, I told her story. From the time I was one to five, um, my mother and my stepfather basically sold me as a dildo. Mm. And I was taken by people, and I was violated, and I was tied to beds, and people did whatever they wanted to me. From the time I was five to 10, my stepfather then basically did whatever he wanted to me and used me to get people to come other children to come that he could violate. I was always just a sexual object. And then my mother died, and my stepfather married me and got me to be his pimp. And I would lure other children into the house. Wow. And eventually one of them died. And she broke down crying. And she said, I didn't even know why I was in prison when I got here. Mm. Because the moral the relative moral reality of my life. No one told me what we were doing was bad. That's right. I was born into that badness. It took me seven years in prison to understand what I was doing, and then I began to cut myself. And she said, please never let me out of prison. Wow. And I literally just sat there and wept. Wow. I wept because I had made a decision about that woman. I had written her off. I had, I had told a story about that woman I didn't know who that woman was. That's right. And my whole life changed after that, except around men. It was my one area yeah. where I, I was justified in my rage and justified in my hatred. And I think part of what overcoming violence is, is overcoming the places mm. where you could justify violence in yourself, right? Where you could say, I can do that to that person yeah. because of who they are and what they've done. It's perpetuating a sense of violence and willingness to violate. And I think, I think it's so hard to feel for people who have hurt you. Yeah. It's the hardest thing in the world to do, but it's also the most liberating. Yeah. Because you realize you hold that person in yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You hold the person who has hurt you in yourself. And when you feel for them, you can release them. Mm. You can release them. I have to say, at the end of this book, when my father says, or I say, I don't know who says, old man be gone, 
You know at the end of Peter Pan when Tinkerbell just goes, yeah. that's what it felt like? Yeah. I felt my father returned and went somewhere new in the ethers, and I felt he was gone. And to be honest, he's never been back. Oh, wow. He's gone. Mm. I have no more rancor. I have no more hatred. Mm. I, have, I have nothing. It's done. The story's over. And mm. I see how much more compassion I have towards men. Mm. And I see how many more men are being attracted to my work because I'm not putting out my rancor. I'm not putting out my hatred. That they feel there's a space for them to come in and talk about their pain. Mm. But it's been hard work. Can I thank you for that? Yeah. Um, can I just say before we pivot to, to a, a conversation about broader politics, um, is that I, it's hearing you say that, you know, we've been friends now for a while, and we met totally randomly. The ART sent me down to New York um, right. and telling our right. origin story when <laughs> your first play here was going up. And they said, do you want to go to New York and interview Eve Ensler? And I was, we'll pay for it. I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> super busy. Um, and so I got on the train, I went down. I had no idea. I was so nervous. I was like a wreck. I was like, you know, questions and what's going to happen. And, you know, I got, I got off the elevator and there you were and you hugged me and there was tea and we sat down on your, on your couch and we spent the whole morning together. Yeah. I mean, you just completely, I mean, I think you're, 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 you're describing how you felt and all that, but I just want to say as, as this random guy who showed up at your house to interview you, I never felt that. Mm. I tell everyone that you are one of the most unconditionally and radically loving and empathetic people mm, I have you. ever met in my life. Thank you. Thank you. And thank I you. felt that the minute I met you. Thank you. But you were gay. Yes. <laughs> I am a big old queen. Maybe yes, I am. Yeah, Honey, you well, were queer, <laughs> and, and that made all the difference. Right, exactly. I wasn't having that kind of compassion That's for straight true. men showing That's up in my loft. <laughs> Yes. Let's yeah, be clear. Yeah, we queened right out on that couch. We really did. Yes, yes. All right. Well, here we are. Um, <laughs> so speaking of, of, of queering out and, uh, and, and showing out, um, I want to pivot now to the personal and the political. And I'm going to play an image. Uh, I'm going to show an image here, which is going to surprise you. I didn't tell you oh, I was no. going to do this. But okay. there's, a, there's an image here. Joe, if you want to play the image. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> There we are, oh marching in the Women's March the day after the person who won't be named was, was oh installed. Like um, <laughs> so there we are. <laughs> I love that picture. I don't know what in God's green earth I'm doing there. That's quite a, quite a I'm, I'm marching with you, sister. That's what I'm doing. We are resisting there. Oh my um, God. So, <laughs> So Eve and I met, and, uh, and it was uh, Kimberly Crenshaw was there, and Diane Borger was there, and CJ was there, a whole bunch of them. We had a good time. And, um, and that was, that was um, not the start of something, but that was a spectacular day. We, yeah. we talked the whole time we were yeah. marching about yeah. our own critiques of the yeah. march yeah. And, the, and the the hats and the, yeah. the, all the things, and, uh, and certainly our critique of what had happened the day before. Yeah. And, and yet this was seen, I mean, it was the lar single largest day of mobiliza mobilized demonstrations, in the, I think, in the history of the world yeah. that day. Uh, not just here, but yeah. all over the United States, all over the world, um, which was in some ways, a, a, you talk about manifesting, mm -hmm. right? It was a mm -hmm. manifestation of a resistance that has only grown and gotten louder and in some ways more mobilized and, and energized. And so we're living in this reckoning moment, certainly, no question about that, where we are, we are moving through the violence and we're experiencing it in ways that are, that are uh, quite profound. And yet, at the same time, we are living in an age where, where activism mm -hmm. is on the rise again, where mobilizations are, are a regular way of and life, youth. young people, wow. right? Yeah. And it's amazing. And it is, it, if there is a silver lining for me in all of this, it's that, right? And, and as someone who teaches, who's around young people, thank the, the maker, um, that I spend so much of my time around this rising generation. 
how do you make sense of, of this, right? This rising generation, you talk about, you know, one billion rising, right? We, we're a globe that is rising up against these, these systems and structures of violence against these authoritarian regimes, yeah. right? In a, in, a, in, a, in a renewed kind of resistance that at least for me feels, I feel very alive right now, yeah. even though I feel very much also under siege and under threat. So how do you make sense of those things, yeah. that tension you know, and you know, I'm a, I'm a historian, I'm a socialist, Marx, I believe that conflict is what drives history, mm. not some kind of kumbaya consensus, mm. right? So I kind of lean into the conflict because I think it's where the change happens. Mm. And so how do you make sense of this kind of tension between the kind of grief and the rage that's produced by the violence and then the activism and hope that is something that can be its antidote? Well, I agree with you about the conflict, like the friction, yeah. what that does. I always, I always think about what Carl Jung said about this century, that if you can survive with two existing opposite thoughts yeah. at the same time, yeah. you will survive. I feel like that's where we are. I literally feel like in any day I have a whiplash. Grief, we're gonna win, we're losing, it's over, right. it's over. I just died. Okay, no, I'm no, I love the trees, no, I'm not. I'm, I, 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 like, literally, I'm exhausted in an hour of waking up, you know? And, and, um, and I know we're all in the same place. Like literally yesterday, I talked to a friend in the morning, she was weeping about, maybe I was weeping, I can't remember which one of us was weeping, about the death of 2.9 billion birds in North America. Yeah, right. And by the end of the day, I was like, look at Greta, the revolution's coming. And then it was like, oh my God, you know? And, yeah. and so, you know, I, I have had the privilege of being involved in V-Day for the last 21 years, yeah. which is an amazing movement. And, and with One Billion Rising, this, you know, we were going to do this campaign for one year. Yeah. And the first year, it was so amazing. It was in 200 countries. Millions of people rose. And now we're in our eighth year. And I am seeing it, it having gone from the cities yeah. way into the villages, yeah. like in Africa, how it's infiltrated like tribes and traditions that have changed their practices and violence, and how profoundly intersectional it has become over the eight years. There are people rising for the earth. There are people rising for workers. Last year, there were people rising for toilet workers, women cleaning toilets in, 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 in an African country. And there were people on the other side of the world rising for immigrants. So I see the potential of what is happening in all of us. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, you know, I am never, ever going down without a fight. No. I'm not going to go down. That's like, right. you know, the people who are saying, well, why bother? The, the, the tsunamis are always already rolling over us. You know what I mean? There's, this is what I have to say. These aren't my people. The reason I love Beckett <laughs> yeah. is I can't go on, I must go on, I will go on. Yeah. Those, are my, those are my mantras. Yeah. And I, I remember when I was an uh, anti-nuke activist in the, in the um, I think, is Sue's here? Jesus. We were in our same group together and just crazy anonymous women for peace women doing work in those days and yeah. fighting Reagan, who I hold personally responsible for the downfall of America. Oh, yeah. Um, um, but in those days, um, Total really, cosine. core, cosine. core, cosine. core, core, core. Um, mm. But in those days, um, I remember I would be standing on 23rd, and I was not that young then. I mean, I was in my 30s, late 30s. and. I would be handing out posters, come and support our anti-nuke rally, come. And you know, people would be spitting on me and kicking me and ignoring me. And finally this guy said, stopped and he said, you know, I see you out here every week yeah. and people aren't nice to you. Yeah. And you just keep handing out these flyers, like yeah. what's wrong with you? Yeah. And, and, and like, why do you do this? Yeah. And, you know, and I said, you know, <laughs> this is gonna sound weird to you. Yeah. But when the nukes are flying towards us, yeah. we're both going to have a moment. Yeah. <laughs> and you're going to look at them, yeah. and I'm going to look at them, and I'm going to say, I did everything right. in my power That's right. to stop them. That's right. And you're going to feel like shit, That's you know? Right. And, and, and <laughs> then we're all going to be incinerated. <laughs> right. We'll have that good moment, right? <laughs> right. And, and, right. And, and part of me just mm. feels like, you know, there's an expression in Nicaragua, Nicaragua that struggle is the highest form of song. We Americans, mm. we are spoiled people, mm. many of us. We don't know how to struggle. We don't know what struggle is. Struggle is beautiful. Struggle is sex. Mm. Struggle is, is, is music. Struggle is power. Struggle is 
the point of what we're doing here. And if you make a decision that you're not going to keep struggling and you're not going to keep giving this everything you've got. If you had a child and you're, you were told that your child had a 20% chance of surviving, would you leave the hospital and go home and prepare their coffin? Or would you sit by the bed and will your magic and will your miracle into that child to survive? Mm. And for me, that's what I feel about where we are right now. Yeah. We might have a very small percentage, but aren't we going to do everything in our power to put enough energy that we raise the vibration for the potential of a miracle occurring? Yeah. Aren't we going to do that? Yeah. Aren't we going to do that? Isn't our mother worth that? Mm, mm. It's, I was smiling when you were talking about the nuke, the nuke um because i am as you i'm weird like that right <laughs> as you know i'm a little bit younger than you i grew up in the in the 80s i came of age during the aids crisis and reagan and, and I, mm. I started fifth grade in 1980 when he was elected and then i graduated from high school when george hw bush had just gotten elected so i mean th those were some quite prime years and in fifth grade you'll love this story i got in trouble because we were doing a spelling exercise in my fifth grade class I loved spelling. I was a very competitive spelling bee nerd. <laughs> and we did these, sh these, the equivalent then of shelter in place drills. These air raid drills were like the thing would go off and we'd have to go out and like crouch under our, you know, <laughs> by, the, by the cement wall and so forth because the Soviets were going to send the nuclear. And I, I thought all this was absurd. I mean, even, I mean, I was raised by a radical grandmother, but that's probably why. But I got sent to the principal's office because I refused to leave my desk. Everyone else was huddling against the wall <laughs> and I was doing my fucking spelling assignment. <laughs> And my teacher said, you need to go to the office. I said, why am I in trouble? I'm doing my homework. And he said, well, you didn't do the drill. I said, if they are going to send nukes, to us, I would rather die doing my spelling assignment than cowering against the goddamn wall. Right? You know, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. It was my version. I wasn't old enough to stand on the street with the flyers, but I was, you know, there it is. Um, <laughs> Speaking of classrooms, I'm going to make an awkward transition. And it's a question I talked with you about on speakerphone in the car today. Um, one of the things that's happening in this moment is uh, my relationship with my students is, is, is deepening and, and changing in some ways. Um, that they are, you know, there are a lot of people around here that talk about, oh, we can't have politics in the classroom. Literally, I had a dean at the Kennedy School say to me, we can't talk about politics in the classroom. I'm like, we're a school of government. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> but one of the things that's happened, <laughs> so I continue, <laughs> nevertheless, he persisted. So, uh, you know. <laughs> So, but one of the things that's happened as a result of the, the kind of the, the, the new explosion of the, of the Me Too movement, of course, as you noted before, this is a movement that's been a movement of violence against, against violence against women that's been um, in existence for many, many years and, and goes back uh, generations. Um, one of the things that I have found that's happened, I teach this course called The Arts of Communication, and it's a, a course on leadership and communications. And one thing happened a couple of years ago. Uh, I had, there was a week where students were giving value speeches, and this is a speech where they have the opportunity to answer what I call the why question. The why behind the who and the what and the how. To dig deeper, to see what your, mm. what, your, what your roots are, what your values are that motivate your work. And one of the things that was striking is that in a week, the students giving those speeches, nine of the 40 students gave speeches about their experiences with sexual assault. And I, all of them in that iteration of the course, women, I, female identified students. Since then, there have been many more speeches, not mm. all are female identified. And it was a reckoning for me mm. on a number of levels. First, the realization that this classroom community that we had been building together, which we take very seriously in this course, because you have to build a safe mm. space for it to be a brave space, had become both of those things, at least enough that students felt mm. like they could be there mm. and speak their truth in this way, many of them for the first time in public. Mm. And it was also reckoning for me as a male-identified professor, right, with all sorts of embodied privileges, racial, gendered, et cetera, class, um, to try to figure out, like, how I, how, how do I, what's my role here? Mm -hmm. And it felt like it had changed. And then also to figure out how to support all of my students, those who had 
spoken their truth and told these stories, those who had not yet, but maybe wanted to, those who had not yet, but couldn't and didn't want to, those who had heard and listened and borne witness to this, who then were trying to struggle to figure out what to do with it, it changed my classroom, mm -hmm. our classroom. And it's changed my work. And I'm still wrestling and reckoning with this moment we're living through and how to um, how to hold my students mm. in the light mm. so that we can all heal mm. through these stories. Mm. And so your book is, I think, a, a, is an attempt, at least my reading of it, to do that. And yet, my role in this is to bear witness to these stories. I'm sure I have my own apologies to give, mm. but not for these things. Mm -hmm. And I am waiting for some apologies myself for some mm. of these things. So what advice do you give me as a teacher and my students, these precious, precious folks who are inheriting this world, mm. who are walking through the violence with great bravery, mm. but also great fear? Mm. What do you have to say to us as a role model and an inspiration to keep walking? What you're doing right now. Mm. I mean, you're feeling. You know, what is anybody who survived racial injustice or sexual abuse or homophobia or transphobia or, you know, what they want is their feelings to be felt and acknowledged and seen and heard by other people. They want it mm. to be real for people. So I would say that's. For me, that's 100% of the battle, is yeah. knowing that there's nothing any, no one wants to be saved. I, I right. just know, I just, I don't want to be saved, and I don't know mm. anybody who wants to be saved. But what people want to be is felt. You know, um, I, I, I'll tell you a story that's related to that. When I went to, um, I went to Bosnia during the war because I heard that there was a rape camp there where women were being held and raped in the middle of Europe in 1994. And I went and I had all these stories like what I was going to do as a writer and coming yeah. from America and mm. I was going to, I was, you know, I, I was going to save people, don't yeah. you know? I was going to help people and I was going to, you know? And I got there and I was so out of my element. I was so over my head. Yeah. It was like, what did I think? I'm sitting in a room with 30 women who had just been raped and held in a rape camp for a month. Right? And I had made up a whole story about what writers do. They don't cry, mm. they don't get lost, they just, you know, right? So I go to this center um, where it was, it was called Medica, and it was in this small little town, and they were, it was healing the rape women. Rape women were staying there, and there was an old woman sitting on a, a big chair, and I sat there and I went. Um, so tell me this. I was speaking like a New Yorker, like, tell me this, 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 this. <laughs> and she just went, Polaco, Polaco, which means slow down. <laughs> and that was my first yeah. clue that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Mm. And then my second clue was that after I'd listened to women for a week tell their stories, I realized I had no ability whatsoever to process them. Mm. And what started to happen was, in the middle of the interviews, I would just start sobbing. And the women would say, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I realized all anybody wanted from me yeah. was to be a human being, right. to sit with them, to feel what they were saying to me, and to mirror back that they were being felt. Yeah. And that's all of us want. It's yeah. not that complicated. It's not. It's not that complicated. But we make it complicated, do you know? So I think, I, and I also want to say, I think when people come into the ability to say their stories for the first time, that is a, a precious, sacred moment. Yeah. When someone steps into their story, being able to say it out loud, there is a sacredness to that that has to be acknowledged and has to be given space and, um, and honoring, honoring. 
Do you know? Just mm. ritualistic honoring so that people then know it's okay then to go further. Yeah, to really take their journey. Yeah. You know, because once the wound is articulated, the wound begins to be broken. Yeah. And so how one comes out with their story the first time and how it is received is critical to how that person will move in the world yeah, after. That's right. I felt that's what I felt. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! All right. Uh, I just wanted to say this is, I think, the third or fourth time that you and I have done one of these. And every single time uh, I do them, I realize just how much more deeply I love you. I feel the same way. And I just want to say, how many men do you get to be interviewed who weep in your interview? Who, I, 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 I just think you're remarkable. And I love who you are in this world. And I love what you're modeling for men, particularly. I Thank love you. you. I Thank, love you. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much.